Ross and Jono with you once again. Thank you for joining us. Uh, last week, we did touch on a, uh, on, a, on a topic that we said we would address this week, and that is what we are doing. We're going to be talking about supersessionism. We're going to be talking about replacement theology and how that contributes to anti-Semitism in the current climate that we find ourselves in. We're also going to be talking at the end of the program about the rally that you and, and Dave and Patty uh, and James Tabor or, or, right. uh, joined in 300,000 strong in DC. We'll save that till the end of the program. Uh, that was very, very encouraging. And we most certainly need very encouraging news uh, at the moment. So it was good to see that. And um, But we are talking about last week, uh, for those who tuned in, you may remember we talked about, um, uh, or you brought up, Ross, Black Hebrew Israelites. Remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Right. And uh, and I mentioned, you know, that there's a, a number of different types of re replacement theology. One of those, um, when it comes to the Black Hebrew Israelites, they're saying, uh, you know, that what you regard as Israel, they're not really Israelites. We're the real Israelites. They were never really the Israelites. We're the actual Israelites. And there's that sort of revisionism going on there. There's other replacement theology that says, yeah, they are the Israelites. They're real Israelites, but we're the new Israel right. that has superseded them. We now sit in place of, uh, and that's done, you know, spiritually or whatever. And, uh, and it, the reason why I highlighted that last week is because I had a conversation last week, Ross, and I wanted to put this to you and see what you thought. Okay. I was sitting in, uh, as you know, I, I attend a, um, I'm very lucky to have in my vicinity a theological library. I love this library. It is. It belongs to a, um, uh, a Christian Reformed college, right, uh, which is fine, but this um, this library has some excellent resources it's a great place to uh to study um i've made some friends there some lovely people that attend the uh, uh the library regularly one of whom is a a hebrew teacher uh by the name of Valister. love this guy and uh I, by the is... way by the way i feel like i know these people jono because when when you and i talk on the phone you say, oh, I just talked to Alistair. He's helped us on some Hebrew questions. He has. Really he, some he, great people. He's really great because his Hebrew is excellent and he's more, always more than willing um, to be of assistance. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is, obviously, we have theological differences. And um, uh, every now and then a conversation will come up where these theolog theological differences become quite evident. Now, the, the, the conversation that I'm referring to now is not a conversation between myself and Alistair, but uh, a student that was there last week. I won't mention his name. Nice guy. Yeah. Uh, but he noticed uh, my armband because I wear this now wherever I go. And now, it's, is, this, you know, is, this a young, is this a young student, like college age? Is that? No, or... they're mid 30s um, okay. at, at, you know, in, in Christian college. And this is a reformed uh, college. And that, that's fine. Like, I have to remember where I am, be very respectful. Uh, and appreciative of um, the membership that the free membership, by the way, that they've granted me uh, of the library and to use the space, um, photocopy a librarian, huge desk, nice. you know, overlooking this beautiful view. It's just, it's just great. Everything about it. So it's, it's a really good place to uh, utilize. But um, this conversation started, and of course, um, considering what's going on in the world today. Uh, it was not unusual for this individual to say to me, so can you, what is your view of the current conflicts and uh, and wh what's going on? I don't really understand, you know, and I, uh, I mean, I can kind of see, um, you know, that uh, on one side there's this and on the other side there's that, and that, that tells you a lot immediately oh, yeah. where where they're already equating both sides as, as being somehow uh, justified in their actions. Yeah. And... And I was amazed because before this individual were a, a number of Bibles on the desk, he was working very hard. And I said to him, what are you studying there? And he said, oh, I'm in the book of Romans. And I thought, aha, well, that <laughs> goes a little way to explain. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, um, you know, I was, I was explaining a little bit about the current conflicts and uh, uh, the, the fact that, or at least I say the facts, but I certainly, and I think you would agree, and probably most people here would agree that um, uh, the uh, Israel becoming a, a nation once again 
Oh yeah, uh, is a fulfillment of prophecy, right? And uh, and I said to him, I mean, don't you see that Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy in your Bible? I mean, we have uh, Isaiah chapter sixty six, for example. We have Jeremiah chapter thirty one. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 16 and Jeremiah uh, Jeremiah are all over the place actually oh, yeah Micah chapter 4 this uh, you could rattle off a whole lot more and and um, and in fact maybe we'll read through some of those and he said you know I don't I don't see that I said how can you not see that and he said well I mean you know there's Israel there's Israel back then and then there's like you know the Jews of today and I thought hang on what is that right what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, I mean, Israel back then is not necessarily, and he had, but he couldn't quite articulate what he wanted to express. He was confused by it. And the yeah. reason why he was confused is because of a doctrine of supersessionism. The church has replaced Israel. This is still in uh, not all denominations of Christianity, by the way, as you found out yesterday. Not all, not all denominations of Christianity still hold on to this. Certainly, post nineteen forty eight, right? They, they have to uh, reconsider their uh, doctrines, their theologies. But many do, many still do. And I thought, well, this is fascinating uh, that this still exists, and it certainly exists, not just within some uh, denominations of Christianity, but also in Islam, and uh, which is something I didn't know that much about and i'm still not yeah. an expert on at all and maybe you have something to add to that but um but this conversation continued and i thought my goodness i can't believe what i'm hearing here and i said look just do me a favor and open your bible to jeremiah chapter 31. so we did that and uh, now i'm going to read it to you from one of our favorite translations and that is a christian translation and that is uh the american standard bible okay um I was a bit of a fan of the New American Standard. I had one when I was very, very young. Yeah. And, uh, and I quite liked it. Um, but you brought to my attention some, uh, some um, differences between that translation and the original. And I have to say, I think I'm, I'm really warming to the American Standard Bible in general. Uh, you're talking. Right, wait, so, just one second for clarity. When you you're you're referring now to the ASV of 1901, the earlier version, and not the New American Standard. I do, but not not the New American Standard, but the original one. Yeah, that's right. I got you. Yeah, 1901. Okay, all right. Yeah. So I'm going to read it from there if that's okay. <clears throat> I yep. like this. So this is Jeremiah chapter. <clears throat> excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 to 37. Thus saith Jehovah who giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, who stirreth up the sea so that the waves thereof roar. Jehovah of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from me, saith Jehovah, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. For thus says Jehovah, if heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, then I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith Jehovah. Yep. What does that say to you, Ross? Well, not only does it say that Israel in the Bible is Israel, is Israel, is Israel, but it also, in context, as you, you, brought, you brought out with these guys, if I recall hearing you tell the story, it's part of the new covenant, so it indicates a, a later time. So, well, how right. did they respond to it? Did they have any answer at all? They didn't. Uh, they, they did the, um, well, you know, I guess i got to look into it a little bit more, but I just think that both sides and da-da-da-da-da, which shows uh, the reason why there's a, a gravitation towards this sort of both sides idea uh, is because they feel like they don't have a dog in the fight. They have that yeah. Bible in front of them, but it doesn't apply to them in, in such a personal way because of, of this replacement theology. In fact, even more so for those who do understand replacement theology or supersessionism, um, they are motivated to the other side, uh, in defense of the other side, Hamas, and, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, because, let me... Yeah, go ahead. Because, I, that's what I was going to say. Go ahead. Right, because 
while Israel still exists, um, uh, it, it, it means that they are still the chosen people, right? Uh, yeah. They are still the people of God uh, for whom many prophecies are yet to be fulfilled. And that's incredibly inconvenient, right, for a, uh, for a theology that says, no, 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 they're old, they're passed away, they had their chance, they've been cut off, you know, the branches yep. have been cut off and you've been grafted on and now you are the real deal and it's all about you and these prophecies are about you. Um, whilst Israel continues, uh, and, and not just continues, Ross, but continues to um, be uh, religious and uphold the texts of the, of the Old Testament um, as, uh, uh, as sacred scripture, um, whilst they do that, it's incredibly inconvenient. They should just go away, accept the fact that they've been superseded, um, that they're old and, and, and obsolete, and, um, and, and just leave it alone because we're the new thing. So this yeah, is if Israel, thing. if Israel, if Israel means Israel, mm. then they don't feel that they have a place in God's redemptive story. And, and that's the problem, right? Mm, that's the problem. That's a problem. So it creates this 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 theological discomfort, uh, and so in some instances you find uh, uh, Christians and certainly um, Islamists gravitating towards, uh, even supporting terrorists that have done such barbaric things. Like we watch this and we think, how in the world can people join this crowd? Like you see yeah. the crowd, and again we'll talk about this later in the day. You see the crowd of. Uh, the three hundred strong, uh, three hundred thousand strong in uh, in DC, peaceful, loving, calm, happy, uh, united, just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And then you see um, the the three hundred thousand strong in London just last week, uh, and and the th the threat of violence and the vile signs that they were holding and the anti semitism that was flowing, you know, um, uh, along the streets there, and and you think. How is it that, that people can view these two groups and go, ah, I'm yeah. going to go with that one. I'll go with the hey, terrorist. Let me, let, let, let me yeah. jump in for just a second. I, I don't want to derail your train of thought here, but I, I tell you, it's strange when you talked about this encounter with these uh, Bible students there where you, where you go to study at the library. Mm. It, I wrote a statement that you probably saw and put it on Facebook because of this supersessionism mm. That, that I'm seeing too. And you would be surprised at how many people have written me and they, they've said, and it, I, I don't really have a count yet. It's been quite a few actually who've said things like, A, uh, I don't agree with your stand on Israel. Now, I think you read what I wrote. It's not like I got really uh, deep with this. It's just a biblical statement. Here's part of it, Jonah. Let me just touch this. Hmm. Um, obviously, those who hold anti-Semitic views deny Israel's right to exist, um, suggest that Israelis are not the Israel of the Bible. This is beginning to get into this. Uh, mm -hmm. Or that the modern state of Israel is illegitimate, I must assert, that my content, community, and teachings are not aligned with such beliefs. It's therefore best to seek content that reflects your views. Go somewhere else. And then I, right. I, I give a little bit more detail. Now, let me, let me say one more thing. In the last few days, I've had a couple of people write to me, and it comes across like they're chiding me. You know, like, so let me get this straight. You're saying that if I don't agree with your views on Israel, that we can't be friends or that we can't have discussions. or I mean, and I'm thinking, and I usually respond with, go read this statement because I want to know what do you not agree with in this very straightforward, you know what I yeah, mean? I mean, it. what do you, I don't know. It's, it's troublesome. No, it and, and, and it's very, very fair. And, and, and <laughs> because... <laughs> I, you cannot help, I can't help, but forgive someone from speculating after reading the many, many passages that specifically deal with Israel returning to the land and becoming a strong nation once again, that they read that and they go, oh, you know what? I think that just happened. Clearly, <laughs> this is yeah. a fulfillment of prophecy. 
I, I, it, it, it's so overwhelmingly obvious that yeah. I cannot imagine anyone who proclaims to be a fan of the Bible would ignore that except for the reason that the theology will not allow them. And the only way that they can deal with it is to say, well, the Israel that, that is occupying the land, and, and this individual that yeah. I was talking to was referring to it as an occupation, you know, that the occupiers. Right, the occupying force, the colonialists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like this is not, it's like, really, I mean, it, it, I thought this is fascinating because here he is with, with numerous Bibles in front of him. And look, lovely guy, and I'd love to speak to him. Again. Really nice guy. But, um, but referring to them as occupiers, when, when the Bible in front of him uh, and the God that he claims to worship is saying, I will regather them to their land, and they just yeah. can't accept it. So what I'm wondering, maybe we can read a couple more passages uh, that come to mind, Ross, in uh, that, that deal with the, this fulfillment of prophecy. Well, and, let me let me ask you, before, before we do that, should we, and obviously we didn't go through and, and put together it, at what point do we want to read just how thick this replacement theology is? I have this statement that someone left as a comment. We can give do it later. Can uh, I give it? A, give us that first, because and, and um, the reason and, and this is in response to the to the statement that you put out, right? Th this is uh, a response. What you're talking about? I did a a class. I've done three classes in a row on Saturday mornings that relate to biblical Israel. And this most recent class that I did this past Saturday is mm. called God's Great Nation. And I play off this term, mm. Goy Gadol. You know, you begin in Genesis chapter 12, and it, and it talks about uh, Abraham mm -hmm. is told, Avram at the time is told God, by God, I'm going to make you into a Goy Gadol, a great nation. Then he talks mm. about all the things that he's going to do and, and do for Abram. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, and, and so anyway, so this was a response to that class. This is one of the comments that was written, uh, and here's what this person says. With the establishment of the new covenant by our Lord prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, the old covenant was abolished, Jono, together with Judaism... Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Ross, but isn't that interesting? Um, uh, verses 31 to 34? Or was he talking about chapters 31 through 34? No, he's quoting. He's quoting, he's quoting, quoting the verses? He, he is, he is getting, he's talking about the quotation about the new covenant. Jeremiah right. 31. Stop, stop see, quoting. you kicked us off. You kicked us off with uh, Jeremiah 31, verse, verse 35 through 37. 31 mm -hmm. through 34, Behold, days are coming, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land. So he's saying, based on that, here we go, Jono, the old covenant, the old one, and Judaism are done away with, and the Jewish people became no longer God's chosen. Instead, they were punished like Cain, Genesis chapter 4, verse 12, for the deicide and rejection of the Messiah. And they became restless wonders on the earth as foretold, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 33. And their right to the land was forfeited. Now wait, it gets better. It gets worse, yeah. actually. But um, this person has their theology really nailed down. He, you know, this person has given a lot of thought to this or either copied and pasted from his study Bible. Then, believers of the one holy Catholic apostolic church instituted by our Lord have become new chosen people, Jono, new Israel. Any biological and physical relationship with Abraham and Israel has nothing to do with salvation of souls, which is a spiritual matter. All prophecies in the Old and New Testament about God's chosen people that are related to the end times before the second coming of Christ, or about his church, Jono. I'm sorry, this is a long one, but it's worth listening to. Revelation 21, 9 through 10, Ephesians 5, 23, and not the state of Israel, a nation in the Middle East. Last paragraph, Jewish, Jewish people and nation are still under God's punishments, Jono, until they repent and convert 
which they will do during the time of two witnesses, Revelation 11, 1 through 13. Then they'll be forgiven of their crimes and saved, Leviticus 26, 40 through 45. Now, mm. this is from uh, Hayim, uh, Hayemen Kwun. So uh, thanks for your comment, Hayemen. Thanks for your comment. I mean, because you yeah, really wow. do, you nutshell replacement theology very, very well. It, I mean, it that really, really it really is. It's a good, he, he does a good it, job. Yep. <laughs> he or she. And the new Israel. So now let, let me read you something. So this is um, <laughs> what I'm going to read you. What I, what I found in, uh, in just refreshing my memory on um, replacement theology is that uh, so-called Jewish organizations or, or rather Messianic Jews or Christian Jewish organizations that seek to uh, convert Jews to Christianity. They go a long way to own these sins of the past, um, yeah. the, the anti-Semitism and replacement theology and, and the roots thereof, to distance themselves from it and say, no, this is wrong and this is, the, this is where it comes from. So they actually craft very, very good essays and, and articles on the topic. And this particular one is from Jewish Voice, right? This is a, okay. a, um, a an organization that seeks to convert Jews to Christianity. And it's called, What is the Source of Replacement Theology or Supersessionism? The source of replacement theology came about in the first century. Uh, the Messianic Christian debt to Hebrew scripture, Jewish exegesis and divine revelation were evidence of all the follow followers of the way. In fact, Jewish Christian relations, in spite of the second and third century uh, Christian elitist assaults upon all things Jewish, uh, continued with good rhythm and solid relationship until the mid fourth century with the advent of the first Council of Nicaea. Now, I'm going to quote from that in just a minute, but uh, at the Council of Nicaea, under Constantine's oversight, uh, the church formally disconnected from the Jewish roots of Christian theology and uh, practice by separating the celebration of Easter from the celebration of Passover. Because this is what this is what's called the Quarto Decimon controversy, right? Do right. we celebrate uh, the crucifixion? Celebrate the crucifixion? Um, you know, Last Supper, crucifixion, all that, all that kid and caboodle. Do we do that uh, over Passover? Because you know, obviously, Jesus had a Passover seder with the disciples. Or do we do it on Easter? Right, a lot of Christians don't even consider the fact that uh, Easter doesn't even appear. The word doesn't appear in their Bible, nor the uh, etymology of the of, of the word hold, Easter. Hold up, is. hold up, hold up. Unless Go they ahead. use a King James, and then it's one time I think in the book of Acts, and and I'm going way back. It's a mistranslation. The Hebrew or the English mm -hmm. is translated from the Greek Paschal, uh, which is clearly related to the Pesach. So, uh, but there's. But there's one place, I think it's uh, um, in Acts 4.12, if was, I'm not mistaken. But. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's in Acts. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. uh, it, it's, a, it's a clear bias mistranslation because they needed to be there. Um, Easter, obviously, from Ishtar. <clears throat> What's that? Babylonian fertility goddess or whatever. Yeah, um, Ishtar. <laughs> which is hilarious to point out for people who don't know. Anyway, it continues, um, uh, but the sentiments of the bishops of Nicaea have their foundations in debates that began in the 2nd century. Justin Marta crafted his dialogue with Typho the Jew on the heels of the, of the Bar Chokba uprising in the land of Israel, uh, then under Roman rule, and first called Palestine. Now, if I remember correctly, now that was um, uh, 135 CE, and that was Hadrian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is that right? It was Hadrian so. that... Um, renamed Israel Palestine. This is where all these morons that are uh, out there protesting in favor of Palestine, Palestinians, all that sort of stuff. Actually, was, Jono, uh, you're you're on a Jono, you're on a roll tonight, but let me let me jump in on this. I think we ought ahead. to do I think it's time we really need to do a discussion on the origins of Palestine because I mean like really get into it. Because sure. uh, and Absolutely. tell it like it is. So we'll get into that in another class, but Let's let's do that, yeah. Because I think I think that's where it came from. He decided to call Israel Palestine. All Romans from now on refer to the to the area as Palestine, uh, as uh, to spit in the face of the Jews, um, uh, name it after their historic enemy, uh, the Philistines, right? Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's why. The, okay, so it says uh, the dialogue was finally published in uh, uh, 150 CE, some 15 years just before Martin's uh, Justin's martyrdom. 
Uh, here, Justin made his strong case for, as you pointed out, a new Israel or a true Israel in replacement of biblical Israel, hence the term replacement theology or supersessionism. Uh, and, and that's where that comes from. So, yeah, Martin, uh, uh, Justin Martyr, Martyr rather, is um, responsible for this, this new Israel, uh, this sort of supersessionism. But the, the Council of Nicaea, as I, I mentioned just before, we have quotes from uh, uh, Emperor, Emperor Constantine. Are you ready? Oh, my I'm goodness. I'm ready. Okay, this is, this is what he said. Um, he said, it appeared an unworthy thing. The Council of Nicaea, I think it was, what, 325 Yeah, BCE? 325. Uh, CE, rather. Uh, CE. Um, yeah, uh, Emperor Constantine. It appeared an unworthy thing, Ross, that in the celebration of this most holy feast, we should follow the practice of the Jews who have impiously defiled their hands with enormous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted, deservedly afflicted with blindness yeah. of soul. Goes on to say, let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our Savior a different way. Um, it is... Uh, um, outlined in, in a little more detail in uh, Theodoret's classical, uh, ec ecclesiastical history records, the epistle from the Con uh, Emperor Constantine concerning the matters distracted at the council, uh, transacted at the council addressed by the bishops who were not, uh, to the bishops who were not present. It says in there, it says, it was in the first place declared improper to follow the custom of the Jews in the celebration of this holy festival. Now, again, we're talking about the Quarto Testament controversy, Easter versus Passover. Uh, because their hands, having been stained with crime, <laughs> the minds of these wretched men are necessarily blinded. goes on to say, let us then have nothing in common with the Jews who are our adversaries. Let us, it goes on to say, studiously avoiding all contact, all contact with that evil way, for how can they entertain right views on any point who, after having compassed the death of the Lord, as, as you pointed out, the deicide, being out of their minds, are guided by, um, uh, not by sound reason, by, but by an unrestrained passion. Uh, unrestrained passion. Unrestrained passion, wherever their innate madness carries them, goes on to say, lest your pure mind should appear to sharing the customs of the people so utterly depraved, Ross, which um, uh, I think um, Calvin <laughs> the, yeah. it reminds me of uh, the, the, the Calvinistic um, The five idea points of, uh, of Calvinism, totally yeah. Depraved. Utter, uh, utter like, depravity. Utter, to, yeah, total, total depravity. I like to say of all, of all the totally depraved people that uh, I've ever met, the Calvinists are the nicest. Anyway, hmm. uh, utterly depraved. Therefore... This irregularity must be corrected in order that we may no more have anything in common with those parasites. So I had to look that up. What is a parasite? A parasite is someone who murders their parents or, or perhaps um, uh, a wow. member of their own family. Those parasites and the murderers of our Lord. <laughs> no single point uh, in common with the perjury of the Jews. So... Um, uh, there it is. Now, speaking of, <laughs> oh my word! Speaking Man, of, you, um, did you you yeah. uh, you you pulled this? Is this what you worked on this week at the library after you you met with the the guy the students there? Is this you you pulled in it, it, some it good really, stuff? It well, it heightened my my curiosity because I I mean I've I've looked at all this stuff before, but it was probably about ten years ago. You know, when I was uh, really in the peak of um, uh, counter missionary activity and. Um, uh, the roots of uh, replacement theology and all of this sort of stuff. But to see it still blinding the eyes of bi so-called Bible students with Bibles in front of them, not being able to acknowledge uh, the fulfillment of prophecy before them and therefore uh, playing the moral equivalence game or, or even siding with um, uh, those against Israel, it was bewildering. And so I had to, when I, when I, uh, started to investigate this once again, I thought, oh, that's right. It's like this. It's like that. It's, this is horrible. So just, just to illustrate it further, and then we might get into some of these, um, uh, you know, Bible prophecies. 
This was Calvin, okay? So we, I'd, I'd mentioned Calvin just before. Here's a quote from Calvin. Their rotten and unbending stiff neckedness deserves that they may be oppressed unendingly and without measure or end, and that they die in their misery without the pity of anyone. Wow. Now, by the way, when, yeah, this is, this is Calvin. This is a, Calvin. This a nice Christian uh, that says this, right? And, and the reason why he says it, Ross, is, is because of uh, replacement theology. It is an absolute inconvenience to his theology that they continue to not only exist, but to hold dear um, their sacred texts and to, and to pray and to be religious and to uh, yearn for uh, the prophecies to be fulfilled and, and so on and so forth. Um, so what we have is uh, being at the Reformed Library where I go to study, it was great. I could go straight to Calvin's commentary and, uh, and read what he had to say. And it was amazing. I, I, um, I went straight to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 to 37. I thought, what is uh, Calvin's take on this? And in every single instance, now the thing I like about um, Jeremiah chapter 31 here is that it makes reference to the seed of Israel. It can't be any more specific than the seed of Israel. And it says it twice, I think in verse 36 and verse 37, if I rem remember correctly. Um, you, you read uh, translations like the NIV of those um, uh, verses, and the NIV will uh, extract the seed of Israel. It wants it to be more generic. It wants, it, wants you to be able to sort of bend the rules a little bit. Well, um, Calvin's not interested in build, bending the rules. When you read his commentary on it, he just replaces Israel with church. The word is now just church. <laughs> hey, that's, so that's the best thing. I guess, I guess if, you, if your point isn't made by the text, you change the text because the text it. doesn't support what you say, so you just change it. I, how many times do we see that in, in almost every mistake people make religiously? That's what mm -hmm. they do. Because they do. Um, and so that's, that's what he does. And now, so we have, um, you know, the early church fathers, if you like, uh, that, that set the stage. And then we have in uh, modern history, the reformers even, uh, you know, carrying on with it. And obviously everything, so a lot of denominations after 1948 sort of stopped and went, hang on a minute, what just happened? What, what just, we need to revisit this. But in any case, here's, while I'm on a, a bit of a roll here, here's. Boy, Martin you are Luther. on a roll. I'm on a roll. Uh, set fire to their synagogues or schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn, so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom, so that God might see that we are Christians. That's Martin Luther. Wow. Uh, and again, it is all off the bat of uh, replacement theology, uh, wishing that those pesky Jews would just go away because you, you, you've had your time in the sun, it's over, wear the new yep. thing now. We're it. We've got a whole, we've got our New Testament, we've got our theology, just go away. Um, and then what we had, and now a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we mentioned um, Charles Taze Russell, right? Uh, and we mentioned him as an early Christian Zionist, even prior to, to Herzl. Uh, he was going around to Jewish congregations, in fact, holding rallies uh, and saying to, to Jewish people, you need to go back to Israel. Now, as, as we mentioned then, his Theology would probably differ to ours, but he saw prophecy in the Bible uh, that he recognized as, as something that needed to be fulfilled and it applied it to the seed of Israel, actual Israel, physical Israel, returning to the land and making it a nation once again. The difference um, with him and the reason why I like him is because he didn't believe in uh, converting the Jews. He, he had a, a theology of dual covenant theology, and we can talk about that in detail another time. Um, now, with this, Ross... All right, oh, all right hold on. Bit? You took a breath. You took a breath. Mm. You go right, ahead. So hang on. Let me, let me say, one thing that I would add is you, you have, not only do you have these... So what happens, I think, is people look at, they're trying to find a way to fit themselves into these texts. Would you agree? So that's one of the main problems. They have to... If Israel is Israel, then then that leaves them 
outside of the covenant, outside of everything. So they just say, as you said, let's just change it from Israel to church or whatever. Hmm. But the other thing is they they have an interesting way to twist the scriptures. They'll take pieces. Let me throw a couple of examples. One of the biggest that I see, and it showed up in this note from uh, the person who posted the comment, it's that God divorced Israel. Okay, so that there's right. this there's this idea that God divorced Israel, and and since God divorced Israel, you divorce your wife, you can't take her back. So they they build, they take a little bit of something, and then they build it on some other legal precedent. Right. So yeah. this is interesting. Now, this is, if I remember correctly, this is a combination of Jeremiah and Deuteronomy twenty four. Is that right? Yeah. So so Jeremiah three is what I was fixing to say. So Mm -hmm. in Jeremiah chapter 3, and by the way, when we went through the book of Jeremiah, this is the one clear reference to in the days of Josiah. Uh, In chapter 3, verse 1, it begins. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now, I'm I'm reading from the Jewish uh, publication, JPS. If a man divorces his wife, so what we have is Jeremiah is now quoting, right, from the Torah, Uh, and she leaves him and marries another man, can he ever go back to her? All right. Would not such a land be defiled? Now you, talking to Israel, have whored with many lovers. Can you return to me, says the Lord? Now, if you read that, you you see this is where they would stop. You know, these Mm. people who have replaced Israel would go, see, but you have to keep going. Look up to the bare heights. It goes on. It talks about how you've done all these bad things. People can read this on their own. Uh, as you work through all the way down to verse uh, 5, what ultimately did, though, if you scroll down, look at verse 7, I thought after she has done all these things, she'll come back to me, but she didn't come back, and her sister, faithless Judah, saw it. I noted because rebel Israel has committed adultery. I cast her off, handed her a bill of divorce. Yet her sister, faithless Judah, was not afraid. She too went in hoard. Indeed, the land was defiled by her casual immorality. After all that, it talks about how she went away. Both these sisters go away. So, But again, I'm just going through this quickly. If you stop at any point, you go, see, God divorced Israel. God divorced Israel. But Here it is, verse 11, And the Lord said to me, Rebel Israel has shown herself more in the right than faithless Judah. Go, make this proclamation toward the north. Say, Turn back, O rebel Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am compassionate. I do not bear a grudge for all time. Only recognize your sin, for you've transgressed against the Lord and scattered your favors. So ultimately what he says, if you go through the rest of the chapter, is come back. Come back. Mm -hmm. We get another example, and I just want to stress this point because I've received this note a couple of times, and here's here's the point. Read Hosea. I know you know this. I was just about to say. Yeah, Hosea is told, go marry a harlot because God wants Hosea, the prophet, to feel Mm. what he feels being married to a prostitute, in a sense. Mm. Yes, Israel and was a a question about that. Is it is it so that he may feel? Is it just so that he may feel, or was it also um, uh, Hosea as a as a known prophet um, on public display to to the whole community that to demonstrate? You know, to demonstrate, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel sorry so, for Hosea, but yeah, keep going. Yeah, and and so the bottom line is, you know, people will take a bit of this. Look, it's it's no it's no mystery. If you read the text, you can see very clearly that Israel, both houses of Israel, Israel and Judah, committed great sin against God. Mm. But the beautiful thing about the Hebrew Bible is that despite all of that, that despite their sins and failures, uh, Deuteronomy nine. If we go back to the uh, the Pentateuch, if you look in Deuteronomy nine, it's it's not because of their righteousness that Mm. God is bringing them into the land to give them this land, that's not the reason. And he says very clearly that's not the reason. It's because Mm. God chose Israel and and he made this commitment to the fathers. 
So a lot of these arguments are moot by these enemies of the biblical record, you know? So here's, now, can I, you just said something. Can I ask you a question? You said it's because yep. God chose Israel. In what, for, for what reason did he choose Israel? For what, what, was, what was the purpose of choosing Israel? For what, for what did he choose them? What, say, say it again. What did he choose them for? Well, I mean, well, you, we understand you... um, people are, are used to hearing, uh, you know, Israel, the chosen people. You know, does that yeah. mean that they're superior to all other people that God has gone? Oh, I like well, these ones the best. I'm going to have them. Or, yeah. um, or, or, you know, they're going to be. They're going to be the best people, so I'm just going to deal with that. Is that what it means, or are they chosen uh, for a particular reason? What? Yeah, in what yeah, way they are they, chosen? they actually are. I touched on this last week, and I'm going to be talking specifically about it this coming Saturday. So I don't want to get mm -hmm. too far into that because uh, it's part of the topic. But if you begin like with Deuteronomy seven, you know, there's this question of for what reason. You know, is it because you're bigger? Is it because of this, because of that? And he gets into that. So I, I touched on that last time. But mm -hmm. uh, you, you may have something else you want to add, but but Deuteronomy 7 is a key text in that regard. Is that where you mm -hmm. were going? No, no, I was just interested in what you were going to say, but I'd like to hear it. So, so give us that, um, uh, that passage then. Yeah, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, um, this particular passage uh, it begins, let's see, uh, verse 6, For you are a people consecrated to the Lord your God. Of all the people on the earth, the Lord your God chose you to be his treasured people. It's not because you're the most numerous of people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you. Indeed, you're the smallest of the peoples, but it was because... The Lord, Jehovah, favored you and kept the oath he made to your fathers that the Lord freed you from uh, with a mighty hand and rescued you from the house of bondage, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And then it goes into, uh, know therefore that Jehovah is your God, etc. So the idea, God has this special task, and, and again, this is what I'm going to be teaching on, Mm -hmm. For what reason does he choose Israel? You know, people can argue how faithfully they walked out that chosenness, but the chosenness is something that God has promised in an oath. And so uh, it's, it's, it is a testament to God's faithfulness, mm -hmm. even in the absence of their faithfulness. Now, one of the things I wanted to touch on, too, all of those church fathers and the, the views, the horrendous views that developed late, the thing that is so powerful that I think is very important to not fail to mention, with people like Charles Taze Russell, with people like the old Schofield, James Tabor and I have talked a lot about this the last couple of weeks, men, stu uh, students of the Bible begin to open the Bible and say, hey, Wait a minute. Mm. What if Israel means Israel? Mm -hmm. What if the place Israel, what if the place Israel represents a real place and not the golden streets of heaven? What if Beulah land is a restored land of Israel and it's not streets of gold in the by and by? Mm -hmm. All of these thoughts, and, and what begins to happen is the Bible begins to make sense. It's, it's no longer out of this world. It's very tangible, and, and you, can, you can read it. You go, hey, this is talking about a real place. It's talking about a real people. But mm -hmm. that's when the conflict comes in, Jonah, which you nailed so perfectly early on. It's that people who have already begun to interpret it differently, they now feel outside of God's covenant and relationship. So, so what do people do? They go, well, so wait a minute. If you're telling me that Israel really does mean Israel, what about me? And mm -hmm. here's the answer. And it's a boxed-in problem because you know what the answer is? This is what I grew up with in church. The new That's the old covenant. Call it the Jew covenant. You're part of the new covenant. The new covenant is for all people. 
you know, and, and that's, mm -hmm. it's a simplistic way to describe it, but that's kind of what they say. But if you go back again and you read Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, in those days, God will make uh, a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Clearly the same people that the, uh, the first covenant was with, if you will. Yeah, quite right. And, uh, and as it goes on, obviously, Jeremiah 31, uh, verses 35 to 37, as I've already uh, read and highlighted there, uh, the, the phrase that's used, the seed of Israel. Now, we see the seed of Israel used in Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Uh, and, and I would highlight that verse in addition to um, uh, the verses in chapter 7 that you highlighted as a reason why Israel is chosen. And um, so if I may read that, uh, in fact, I'll read it from the Moses scroll, if, if I may. Okay. Because uh, it um, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 15 is certainly derived from there. Uh, it says, it is not because of your righteousness, and you've already highlighted this, it is not because of your righteousness that your Elohim is giving into you power to do mightily, but rather Elohim attached with your fathers to love them. There's something in the past there prior yep. to the uh, uh, liberation from Egypt Elohim attached with your fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them from all the peoples. Um, yep. Chosen for what? Well, we see that uh, he, if, if I can use this illustration, he plants within them the seed of the ten words. He says, you're, you're going to represent these ten words. You're going to be obedient to these ten words. You're going to be blessed as a result of observing these ten words and the nations around about will look at you in awe. Yeah. Um, and I think really that is, the, that is the, the purpose for which they are chosen to display, just like Hosea was chosen to display before his community with the situation with his wife, um, that uh, Israel is called to be obedient and display uh, these wise um, uh, precepts that God right. has given unto them. And, so, and in that way, let me ask you one thing. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions in a few minutes, but one thing I wanted to ask you, Jono, and that because mm -hmm. we've discussed this quite often, how Israel is to uh, display this way. You know, I, I saw Rue left a note. Uh, he chose Abraham because he would teach his family justice and righteousness, uh, his family and his household and that they would keep the way of the Lord to do justice and righteousness, Genesis 18, mm -hmm. 18, and 19. So mm -hmm. in the keeping thereof and modeling this way, do you think that that is in some way perhaps related to the idea of being a light to the nations, Jono? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That is specific. I would say that is specific to that, um, uh, that phrase, being a light to the nations. Um, by observing the ten words, being blessed as a result of the of uh, the observance, and uh, uh, displaying that to the nations, so um, that is the reason for which they are uh, chosen. So, I before we um, uh, jump off and open this up, Ross, I just want to mention one more thing because what we're seeing now, I mean, the the, the quote that I read from Luther, for example, we absolutely saw the Nazis yeah. uh, uh, execute. Um, but we're seeing something a little bit different now. We're seeing sort of Nazism and ISIS, you know, joined together and created this um, uh, uh, pro-Hamas movement. Um, so what of Islam? What is the supersessionism of Islam? So, and, and I think I, I pulled this uh, primarily just from Wiki, and it's just a, a, a quick little um, a summary. It says that Islam teaches that it, is the final and most authentic expression of the Abrahamic monotheism. Sure. Believing that it supersedes uh, Judaism and Christianity. Now, we understand that, um, you know, Islam came along centuries after Christianity had begun, uh, the beginnings of Christianity, and, and millennia after, uh, after Moses, after uh, Israel received the Ten Words at Horeb. But the Islamic doctrine of Tarif, teaches that the earlier monotheistic scriptures or earlier interpretations of them have been corrupted by later interpretations of them, while the Quran presents a pure version of their divine message. In addition to that, Ross, uh, and I just want to read from uh, another um, article, just a, a little bit at the beginning. This is an article uh, that appeared in the Jewish Chronicle uh, a couple of years ago. 
and uh, it's by Ben Cohen, and it's entitled "There Is a Jew Hiding Behind Me." Come oh, and kill yeah. him. Yeah. Okay, so this is what it says. When the former Trump administration announced that it was moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in December 2017, the reaction in the Muslim world and among Muslims, uh, in Muslim communities in the West, was predictably furious. In the Friday sermons that followed that announcement, several imams around the world denounced Israel in uncomplicated anti-Semitic terms, many of them quoting the same hadith, a saying attributed to the prophet Muhammad that speaks of a mass slaughter of Jews by the Muslim faithful. Writing about these sermons at the time, I highlighted, says Cohen, three that were delivered at mosques in the United States in that same week, all of which spoke about Jews in genocidal terms. Two of the sermons, one at a mosque in Houston, Texas, and another in Rayleigh, North Carolina, cited a rather blood-curdling hadith that reads as follows, quote, Judgment Day will not come until the Muslims fight the Jews. The Jews will hide behind the stones and the trees, and the stones and the trees will say, O Muslim, O servant of Allah, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. I'll bet that's that not going to happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Go the ahead. same had been surfaced at a sermon given uh, by the uh, imam at the Grand Mosque. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about what happened in France. Um, but how many, how many mosques do you think, how many imams would be preaching that uh, after what has happened, after you know, the, the, with the, the current circumstances that we find ourselves in today? But again, um, we see a form of uh, supersessionism in Islam, it is thoroughly inconvenient to them that not only Jews still exist. I mean, they, they didn't really care that much that Jews existed prior to 1948. But as soon as prophecy is fulfilled and they return to the land, they're like, oh, my goodness, this can't be true. We can't allow this to happen. This is contrary to our belief. And they are angry about it. Ross. Yeah, I, I tell you, it's it's Christians. It's to some degree, it's Muslims. Now, we don't have a lot of Pentecostals or Baptists that are anything but favorable of the Jewish state. In fact, most Protestants and, and most, most Christians, though this isn't all the way true, in fact, in, in, uh, in certain European countries, we see a tendency among Christians to side with uh, what's going on against Israel. But but for the most part, you know, Christian theology does replace Israel to some degree. Christians believe that they're the new Israel. Muslims believe mm. that they're the new Israel. And what we're saying is we're keeping it very simple. Israel equals Israel. When it talks about Israel, it's talking about Israel. Now, this is not even going into the complexities because there are more complexities, as you know. Uh, there. You know, there are uh, members of Israel that are somewhat lost in identity, if you will, or scattered among the nations. Somehow, some way, that's going to be worked out too. I saw Eric ask the question, what do you do with Ezekiel 37? Of course, see, these are the things, but again, it's still Israel. Now, that mm. doesn't also, it, like you've brought up, I mean, there are people who will, uh, uh, from among the nations, also attach themselves to the Jewish people in a friendly way. Zechariah 8.23 says, And in that day ten men of all the languages of the nations shall mm -hmm. grab the hem of the garment of him who is a Jew, a Jewish man, Yehudi, saying, We'll mm -hmm. go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, I've read various uh, commentators on that who said, well, it's interesting that it's 10 from the languages of the... It does, a lot of people think it says 10 Gentiles. It doesn't. It says 10 men of the languages of the nations. So even mm. that, if you read Zechariah in context, it could be a prophecy that at some time and place in the future, non-Jews who might be Israelites coming back uh, would, would grab the hem of a Jewish man saying, we'll go with you. But again, it's the idea that Israel means Israel, uh, whether mm -hmm. you're talking about the two houses uh, separated or together. And I think that's there's something very powerful in that 
And the enemies of Israel don't like it because it takes away from their place. So uh, before we turn it over, and we'll do that in just one minute, let me ask you about that. Because when you went to this pro-Israel rally yesterday, the largest pro-Israel rally in history that you and James and Dave and Patty participated in, um, three almost uh, 300,000 strong. Did you feel like... Did you observe, I mean, I, you would have seen a lot of placards and signs. Were there a lot of Christians there? I would imagine there would be just an enormous amount of Christians because I understand that uh, particularly in the States, the evangelical movement is incredibly pro-Israel. They do see these prophecies as um, uh, of, of Israel becoming a nation again as having been fulfilled in our time. And they are absolutely pro-Israel and, uh, and, and very, very vocal about it. What was your general let, feeling? When let you me tell you, this... First of all, the way this went down quickly, Saturday after the class, we were doing our uh, discussion after I taught, and Dave Tyler said, I'm going to Washington, D.C. to this rally on behalf of Israel. And I said, hey, man, that's great. Seth and I will try to bring you in live, and maybe you could do an interview. And he said... How about you go with me? And I really didn't, that wasn't what I meant. I mean, I really didn't even, but long story short, by after Shabbat, he didn't, he doesn't spend money on Shabbat, but that night or Sunday morning, he bought me a ticket and I flew Monday. And and when I arrived, now here's the thing. I thought that just like you said, you would see maybe Pastor Hagee. They didn't even announce the speakers. But, you know, I figured maybe Pastor Hagee and a lot of these pro-Israel Christians, and there are lots of them, and they do some mm -hmm. good work, and I'm a big fan of that. Uh, and, and they're not trying to evangelize Jews. They're just saying, hey, we love you, and we support you, and we believe you're God's chosen people. But I didn't see, to my knowledge, now Dave and Patty might have seen something else, but what I really saw, this, and this made it even better in some ways, this was, in my view, I think almost 300,000 almost totally Jews. And let me tell you why I know that. When we got there, you had to have a blue band to get in. And the only way to get a blue band was that it had to be from the uh, North American Alliance for Jewish Congregations or whatever. And so what mm -hmm. that means is because they had to have a way to control who gets in the, the gate. So we weren't allowed to go in, Dave and Patty and, and I, but we were right there. It's like you see the monitor. It's right on the other side of the chain link fence. But while mm -hmm. we were there, we saw buses and buses and buses unloading. And I saw Jewish people dancing in the, and they were emboldened. And I loved it. It was so exciting because they were... They were singing, you know, I'm Israel, I'm Israel, I'm Israel. And I, there may have been some counter protests somewhere, but you, there were not sticking their head up that day. Mm -hmm. 300,000 is a lot of people. And, and uh, I, I heard Jeremy Gimpel on, in the airport today. I was listening to something he posted from uh, landofisrael.com. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy Gimpel, a friend of ours, uh, said, you know, think about the number 300,000. The Torah mm -hmm. mentions 603,550 males. This was half of that number of males, according to the Pentateuch, that left Egypt. So there's a symbolism there. In a very short time, the Jewish people pulled that many together. I know I rambled, Jonah, but it, 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 that was just Jews pretty much. So imagine how many people out there would really show up. And let me let me tell you the verse that stuck in my mind in the airport today. I was thinking about this, and then I'll uh, we'll turn it over, but I, or let you respond. But in Second Kings, I think it's Second Kings chapter six. There's a story about Elisha, and uh, he has a servant. Now the servant isn't named here. Uh, but we know his servant's name is uh, Gehazi. But anyway, he's he's preparing to battle, and 
the servant is concerned, but he can't see the spirit. This is a spiritual story. It's, you know, it's in 2 Kings. The writer of Kings often gives us stories where angels and so forth. But I like the story. So here it says in verse 16 of 2 Kings 6, and he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And he mm. opened his eyes so that he could see this army of messengers that were on their side. And for some reason, that verse has been on my heart and you know my mm. mind all day because how many people out there are truly with the Jewish people right now? Because they're right now, they're not Christians aren't under attack. Uh, even if if a Christian said, "Well, I think I'm in Israel. Uh, I'm an Israelite." Well, you're not going to be abused they, because mm-hmm. they know that you're not. They're going to attack the real Jews, mm-hmm. and you know, isn't that strange? And so, anyway, yeah. I I just That's thought really about that today, and and uh, I think that we, you know, I'd love to. Put, Quite you know, vocal yesterday. Yeah. It was it amazing. It was amazing. Right. Loud. So listen, let's yeah. Loud and uh, yeah. So let's turn it over to um, to people, and and I'd like to hear from Dave first. We've just got limited time, so um, Dave, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on yesterday's uh, rally, and uh, and how it impressed you. Yeah, and while we're waiting on him to, did he raise it? Yeah, he raised his hand. Yeah, he also got interviewed yesterday, so. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Let me invite him to the stage. And we'll get we'll get a few more people in, but Dave, tell us what your thoughts were. Am I off or what'd you think? No, uh it was uh it was really uh, an event of a lifetime for me. Um, you know, I went from being happy to crying. Crying because and emotional because why did this have to happen? And a lot of uh, the Jewish people I spoke to said, you know, this anti-Semitism was just under the surface of the water, and it came out in huge numbers. And it's not just um, people supporting the Palestinians. It's anybody who didn't like Jews uh, were just coming in and saying that. So, you know, a couple of my observations, 300,000 people, no fights, singing in joyous times. No, no screaming and yelling, and um, no garbage. And you no. look at when the pro-Palestinian people come; they destroy towns. It's the total opposite. And and how anyone with a just any kind of normal thinking could think that the two are, uh, you know, not equal. It, it blows my mind. Um, you know that part of it was really amazing, and. You know the singing that went on, and and all these young girls dancing, and it, it was just truly heartwarming for me. I didn't know there were that many young Jews that cared to be Jewish. Um, and hey, Dave, Dave, I, other, I, 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 let me yeah. jump in. Let me ask you this because sure. we were there together. Uh, and one thing, just yeah. to piggyback off what you said, there was it exuded life. It it, it was yeah. all about life and an amazing life and. And in fact, how many times did we hear "Hi, I'm Israel Hi"? And Jono, you yeah. mentioned that in Melbourne, when these uh, uh, the the ones who hate Israel, the pro-Palestinian mm-hmm. march, they were screaming "Kill, kill, kill!" Gas the Jews, kill. And that was, that was right. actually in Sydney. They were they were chanting Sydney. "Gas the Jews, gas the Jews, gas the Jews," and that's something that we commonly see in these kind of protests, the pro-terrorism uh, um, rallies. Are right. glorifying death, and your point, Dave, is that uh, the amount of life and celebration of life yeah. was was overwhelming. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, Dave. yeah, yeah. It was good, and and and, uh, and um, you know, um, I I was standing there, and USA Today came up and said, "Can we can we interview you?" And Patty said, "Oh boy, they picked the right guy." So uh, I talked for 30 minutes or 25 minutes to them, and they kept asking questions. They weren't mean. And at the end, uh, the young lady that was um, hearing, interviewing me started to tear up and because I, I just brought up the, the facts, you know, about, um, you know, this, this was pro-Israel, but it's also about anti-Semitism. And oh. I, I'm not going to be 
um, anti-Islamic or anti-Christian. Um, that's their beliefs. Um, and I'm not going to just say, I'm going to kill you because you're a Muslim or, you, or a Christian or a Hindu. Sure. Right. Um, and, she, you know, she was like, and I said, that's the difference here. We're just saying, let let this anti-Semitism go away. It won't go away. Mm. Um, I, I think a division has come. And who knows? Um, you know, for me, it was just a great thing. And, you know, when, when uh, James Tabor met us and, uh, you know, um, and um, Bob White was there. He he can't get into the talk tonight. Um, he's not a member of the Akkad. But um, you know, we we were there, and you know, we we had an hour of, you know, um, just watching the whole thing. It was a spectacle. We went and had a drink, and uh, then James had to go back on his um, bus, and you know, he 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 started at two thirty in the morning, and he ended up two thirty the next morning. So you know, being wow. that he's 76 years old um he cared and um right. you know just the love i sat next to a lady named bridget and i said where are you from and she said vienna austria i said are you a jew no i came here just to support and it was That's like right. mind-boggling to me to listen to these people yeah and then um you know i i spoke to a lot of jewish people um the um you know, they they wanted us to wrap wrap our uh, arms in the tahalim or whatever. Oh yeah, and um, mm. and and pray. You know, and and um, it it was it was truly beautiful and loving, and um, and of course uh, you have to say, um, Ross, I forgot the name, but the Orthodox Jews who hate the state of Israel, they were there too. Oh yeah, oh very yeah. small. They the Satarim or something. The set, the set I think uh, it's the Satmir uh, group. I think that's what um, it's called. Yeah, and of course. They yeah, had their, and they were there. Uh, and, that's a whole other. That, not much. Yeah, yeah, and and they were uh, they were really crazy. And um, like I said, um, to have this day, and you know, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know if I, I don't want to say it like this, but there couldn't they there could not be a better day. The day was so beautiful, not a cloud in mm. the sky, and yeah. I. Um, you know, I really do think that it was meant to be and to show the world that, um, you know, we're, we're not only going to do it better than you, yeah. but bigger than you. Yeah. And that yep. those are the yep. kind of things, um, you know. Yeah, and it received the coverage. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, my understanding is, is that it is it was the largest pro-Israel rally uh, recorded in history. So you guys were a part of that. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm really glad that you were there. Uh, to be yeah. part of it, and and you're now a part of history in that, uh, yeah. in that sense. So, uh, I, I kind of equated it. Yeah, I, I kind of equivalented to um, to when Patty said you're going. She goes, I'm going. I go, no. I mean, this could get could get bad, and um, she demanded it, and uh, so we we drove, um, and the the um, hotels were sold out, so we got a VRBO, and everyone could stay there. And the other thing I wanted to say is this. Could you imagine if if you were supporting Martin Luther King Jr., um, who seemed far away from Martin Luther, uh, um, mm -hmm. he, um, he, he gave his I dream, you know, I have a dream speech, and you didn't go because it was just, you were just too busy with, and you mm -hmm. missed the historical. And, and so that's what I felt it was. Yeah. And, you know, and I like the fact that there were both sides of the aisle were there. Um, supporting Israel, and yes. it wasn't and about politics. Too, yeah, yeah, it was very yeah, encouraging I mean, all around. And, and, and like I said, um, it was a privilege. And you know, then the night we had a really beautiful dinner on the Potomac, and uh, I, I don't yeah. know, it was just a, a beautiful thing. And it, you know, I'm yeah. I'm very extremely yeah. I'm extremely busy right now, and it was really hard to do. But um, you know, we did it, and um, and it was. And, and uh, remember, we were, you were for the rest of your life uh, without yeah. yes. Davis. So many yeah. thousands. So, anyways, world, you know, I, I'm I'm going to write an article on my thoughts and put it up uh, here. But, okay. but right now, um, you know, I'm just writing down things that pop in my mind, and and then of course all the beautiful pictures that that came out of it to me were, you know, pictures we'll have for the rest of our lives. And uh, yep. so Absolutely. it was well, beautiful. Thanks, thanks for and thanks I'm, for um, your thoughts on the, on the matter. Being having been there, David, really yeah. appreciate that, and, and, and for supporting and also, you. Thanks, thanks, thanks for uh, got a, got a hand up. Uh, also, thanks for bringing me, uh, Dave and Patty. It was fun. Mm. All right. So, uh, Lee, 
or Pam? Who Hello is there. Hey, Lee. Lee Stoll. Yeah. Uh, first of all, David, uh, I think all of us were with you that day. That's about we all, all we thought about all day. Uh, I was listening to Dennis Prager that same uh, morning. You guys were there. And he suggested that uh, every supporter of Israel buy themselves a, a mezuzah. And he says you can get different kinds at different prices. Yep. And you can get a kosher one or just a standard box or one that has the uh, scroll written in it, uh, different price ranges. But just, and he says, I don't care if you put it angle up and down sideways, but just put it on your doorpost and it will show the world that you're a supporter of Israel. And that's a good um, one. Yeah, he mm -hmm. also. Uh, has said several times that uh, he's been talking for about 40 years. And if somebody uh, says something uh, negative about him, all of a sudden they'll say, I've been listening to you for 40 years and you said such and such, and I'm never going to listen to you again. He said, why is it the person can make one, say one thing that's a different? Uh, the reason mm -hmm. I'm saying this is um, it was brought to my attention a few days ago on the UI website that uh, uh, Candace Owens uh, has said an anti-Semitic thing. And uh, it was sent a link to me that uh, lasted about an hour. And she was interviewing a uh, Jewish comedian that um, was um, uh, had called her an anti-Semitic. And she was trying to explain her position. Well, I listened to the whole thing and I agree, you know, her being a black lady that uh, is very involved in black uh, issues, she went over to Jerusalem and she um, uh, saw what she calls black or uh, uh, Muslim neighborhoods and the ghettos and that type of thing. She has this attitude that that uh, uh, Muslims must be uh, and Palestinians must be uh, repressed by the uh, Israel because of the the standard of living like blacks are here in the United States. And this Jewish comedian, he said, that's not true. He says, you can, if you're a, a Palestinian, you can live anywhere you want and work anywhere you want. They're in the military. And he was trying to explain. And her answer was, well, maybe you're right, but I'm just telling you the uh, experiences I have based on my understanding, also being a black woman. And I, I thought to myself, I'm so glad that she brought that up. I'm so glad she had that interview. And uh, there was actually another interview the other day with some other talk show people. It's only 15 minutes long that even explained in more detail. Uh, A, she was wrong. A, she, her attitude is uh, she doesn't have the right understanding. However, it's so important for us not to censor people like her. And and also not to judge her for one thing she said when she said so many other good things over the years. But uh, we have to have open dialogues. That's my point of my talk to you yeah, right now. Yeah. We have yeah. to have open dialogue and we can't immediately just have this hate, hate, hate. We Let's not allow them on anymore. And I'm not, you know, Ross doesn't do that for sure, you know, and I. I don't mean that at all. I mean, some people do. Some people, um, you know, if they don't think exactly like we do, then uh, we don't even want to have a dialogue anymore with them. And I well, happen to like the, la the lady a lot. And I, I'm so glad that I'm sorry I keep going on. But <laughs> no, 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 heart. no. But to you, to your point, um, I don't listen to a lot of other commentators, but it's just because I stay pretty busy. But, but for instance, if, Candace Owen or anyone uh, has an opinion and and it's only informed by a little bit, you know, she also knows, and I think I think it's her uh, general, the way she generally approaches a subject is to become very informed before she speaks. So uh, I think what, I don't know, maybe I could get this link and listen to it, but uh, but perhaps this person she was dialoguing with could say, well, can I send you some uh, video and some other data points? Because if if someone, for instance, if she came to my house or or spent some time with me, she might say that all white people 
don't make a lot of money and that they don't have a lot. Uh, but that's not a fair assessment of all white people, right? So if, if her comments are, if if her data points suggest that, and this is just my dialogue with, with you, Lee, as a friend, if her data point was that what she saw was some impoverished uh, Palestinians, of course there are. But, you know, on our Tanakh tour, we drive by places that are Palestinian towns that are filled with mansions. So it, mm. it really, you know, uh, but yeah. but I, I get your point. And uh, I don't know that much of, of what she's done. But like I said, it's just yeah. because I don't listen to a lot of other people. But her, her main point was all genocide is wrong no matter what. But I do believe she's misinformed. She doesn't understand. I have uh, was this recent? Uh, was this recent? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, less than a week ago. And uh, then yeah, there's I'll a, follow, I mean, a I'm, follow I'm up a couple to, days later. Yeah, I'm not a subscriber of of Candace Owens. I, I'm well aware of who she is because I am a subscriber of the uh, Daily Wire, and um, and I always like to say because it upsets all the right people that uh, I think Ben Shapiro does an excellent job of covering. Uh, the current events and um, and explaining uh, the details there, and I, I absolutely watch his coverage every uh, every morning uh, from yeah. the Daily Wire there. But yeah. I'm not aware of um, uh, what Candace has said but, in, uh, in recent weeks. But, but just Lee, on the point that Prager your... made. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Ross. No, I'm sorry, Lee. I was just going to add that um, David says open, healthy, respectful debates are good, and mm -hmm. you know I, I've taken quite a bit of a, a hit the last few weeks because I had to make a stand on this Israel uh, thing. I, I mean, I have to. Like, I have to and I want to and I need to. And and there are people who do not agree with me, and they say, well, you don't, uh, you don't allow any discussion on this, and truthfully, I'm not. Like I'm, I'm simply not going to personally. I'm not. Others may, uh, but I'm not going to debate with someone who who says. And this is getting off of your topic, Lee. But just holding on to that one thread about debating or discussing. When somebody tells me, "Well, you know, both sides are guilty." Uh, when we're dealing with Israel and what what we saw on October seventh, I I don't want to discuss that with them. And, you know, a lot of people don't really understand the whole Middle East and what's going on. How many yeah. times have we heard in the last few uh, weeks, Jono, where people say, well, you know, those people, those people have been fighting forever. You know, it's mm -hmm. Jews mm -hmm. do bad and this, you know, but this is not, you can't equivocate between uh, the Jewish state and the way they're responding to you know, I just so anyway. Mm -hmm. I have been. I have had several people write me and say, "Well, it's not fair that you won't at least entertain my thoughts on it." There are plenty of people who will. So I'm not. You know, go find one of those. I just won't do it. You know. Mm -hmm. no, I, Jonah, I, I kind of jumped in. I have totally no, that's agree right. Just, just, just on what go. Lee said in regards to uh, highlighting what um, uh, Prager was saying, and again, I'm just reading from the from the Moses Scroll, uh, and these words which I'm commanding you today shall be upon your heart and taught incisively to your children. Uh, you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, as you walk along the way, and when you lie down and when you rise, and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be bands between your eyes, and you shall write them upon the door frames of your house and your gates, because Elohim made a covenant with you in Horeb on the day of the assembly. So what's it referring to? Of course, the 10 words. And um, I think that's an excellent uh, way of showing solidarity with Israel and, and where you stand by putting a mezuzah on, on your, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the doors, on the posts of your doors. Yeah. I, I tell yeah, you one it. thing, Lee, we're going to, we're actually, we want to hear from you and not just Jonah and I back and forth. So stay there for a second. Let me say something about the mezuzah. Um, we are going to have a United Israel conference, and it will be in St. Francisville this year in April. Uh, I'll be posting the dates here pretty soon. Uh, but I do want to say that a couple of years ago, we bought just plain wooden mezuzah, uh, a box of them. I, don't even, I probably have 50 or so left, and I could get some more. 
But one of the things that we did, we had paints and people made their own and, and it was their own. It was kind of cool. Um, but, but I agree with that and you can find them on, on, uh, different sites, but what would be kind of cool, this is Jonah, this, you're hearing it right here for the first time. What if we gave everybody that came a mezuzah and a sheet, including the 10 words from the Moses not scroll, just nine, not just nine, but actually 10 words as they appear in the Moses scroll. I think that's an excellent idea and I'm all for it. Uh, and I would proudly put, uh, uh, a mezuzah like that um, on my doorpost. Absolutely, I would. I think that's an excellent idea. I think it's something I that think should be we done. Might I made do it available it. on the website. We're going to talk more about this, and I think maybe if we get Daniel Wright involved, uh, we, we can come up with something pretty spectacular. Um, Lee, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we close out? I just out? wanted to say that uh, I've been listening to Ross for four years, since 2018. I always thought of you as like a Wells or Cronkite where he the news, but you never... Let us know if you're a Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, whatever. And I love that. Absolutely loved it. But lately, you, you've been drawing the line in the sand, and I absolutely love that. And I, I'm, I'm just so glad to know where you stand on these things because they are very, very important. Uh, I have a Israel uh, sign on my Facebook picture, uh, mm -hmm. but I, at this point in my development, I don't wear those things on my corners of my shirt i don't you yeah. know i don't uh, i don't do these things i wouldn't want to put an israel sign out in my front yard i have two american flags out there but i i'm i'm, I'm not jewish so i right. i don't want to walk around like a jewish person but i love I, that i a hundred percent agree with putting them in mazoots out and i definitely want to do it mm. Well, I tell you what, I'm I'm gonna make sure that uh, I'm gonna follow up on this because I do think it would be a great idea, mm -hmm. and I'm glad you brought that up, Lee. That is, you know, because you there are reports me that bet. <laughs> do what? I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me bet. No, no, no. It, it was some good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah, so I, we'll we'll think about away. that. Maybe have some for the conference. I'm making a Thank note you. right now, Jonah. Excellent. Um, all right. So anyone else want to uh, jump on the mic before we uh, begin to close the program? Anybody else? Hey, look, Jonah, this this is fun. I I really appreciate all the research that you did leading up to this. I'm sure that a lot of people have followed you for a while and they know that you actually have a degree in theology. And so I guess at some okay. point during your uh, during your school, you may have had to study this. When you first used supersessionism, I, I honestly had never heard of that term. I mean, I, obviously, I, I knew replacement theology, uh, but when mm. I, I looked the word up, I was like, oh, okay, well, because you had texted me something about that. But yeah. I tell you, it's yeah. it, kind of pulling together the, the different points that we made tonight there are a lot of different forms of anti-Semitism, and to strip away Israel's right to be Israel is one mm -hmm. of the the most uh, heinous crimes. You know, if you if you're talking about biblically, and and there are a mm -hmm. lot of different ways to do that, and and I think we ought to be very very careful. And Lee, you put it perfectly. Like I tell people, I'm not Jewish. And people say, well, maybe you're from the Lost Tribe. I don't know. All I know is I'm not Jewish, and I've tested my DNA, and I don't have any connection to uh, the Jew. I'm a Viking. But I tell you what, but when it comes to Israel, I stand with Israel. And some of David's mm -hmm. strongest warriors weren't Israelite. And if you look Vikings at— Vikings for Israel. Yeah, Vikings for Israel. But no, but I, I do think that that we can and should stand as righteous among the nations, stand mm -hmm. up on behalf of uh, known Israel and to the Jewish people, uh, stand with them. And one one great way to do that is to to put the mezuzah up. I don't wear a kippah, but in places where I, I've heard this, but in places where people are getting beat for wearing a kippah, some mm -hmm. others, non-Jews who, you know, I've, I saw a video the other day and this big tough guy 
had a mezuzah on and and uh, he's walking down the street. He's not Jewish, but he said, "I hope somebody comes to get me." You know, he's I not even. Yeah, he had, the guy had a kippah on. He said, "I'm not Jewish, mm. but they're attacking people with uh, with a kippah." And he said, "I want to see what happens when they get a surprise when they attack me." Yeah. I'm just saying there are ways that we can say and different. I'm not telling people to do something you you shouldn't do. I'm just saying there are ways to identify, and this masuza thing is a really good way. And and uh, uh, mm. I think it's I, I love it. I love it. Excellent. That is the program for today. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you again this time next week, one hour early, so uh, 7 p.m. Louisiana time. And uh, do we know what we're going to talk about yet, Ross, next not week? Yet, maybe not we'll yet, not to... yet. But, uh, but I, I tell you, it might be, it might be, I'm thinking that it might be that we do uh, the history of Palestine. Could we, do you think we could do that? Maybe talk about the... You know, the origins of Palestine? Yeah, the origins of, yeah, because we touched on that this week. Okay, we can expand upon that. Let's see if that's what we're going to do. But we will be back this time next week. Appreciate you being here and uh, everyone's input. And thanks to Dave and to Lee. And uh, everyone has been leaving comments. And um, no, it's great. So, again, Mary Ann says, uh, Mary Ann says she loves the artwork that Seth did on the photo of us. General, I don't even, I know, if you've se- I don't even know if you've seen it yet, but it is so good. Worried. And uh, yeah, but it's it's the the reason that we did that. Jono is Jewish, but we're not doing a uh, we're not replacement theologians. What we are, though, is we wanted to make the point. I thought it was a good idea, so I think it's wonderful. I'm gonna go look look now. this this Saturday, uh, ten thirty a.m. Central Time. We we hope that all of you can join us, and uh, I, I'm going to be talking more about Israel from a biblical context, and so I look forward to that. But if if you're with us tonight, uh, remember, tomorrow, Thursday, we are going to premiere this, and uh, we'll, we'll premiere it, and then that way, those who are listening to it tomorrow on Thursday night, you'll have a whole week to join the Yakod if you want to be part of this audience. That's what I just wanted to say before we go, is how do people become part of the studio audience? Just real quick. That to, to be part of the studio audience, they can either subscribe to the channel and become a member of the YouTube channel, or they can join at any level, whatever level they, they can fit in comfortably uh, on our Patreon. And that, that helps Seth and I. It pays the bills. It also helps us to produce more content. So uh, simply either join the Patreon, join the YouTube channel, and if you can't do either, you, you still get the content. You just can't be part of this audience. We're doing this as a special way to say thank you. So everyone, thank you. Dave and Patty, thank you for bringing me with you uh, to this wonderful event. And I uh, look forward to, to seeing everyone tomorrow night if you've got time for the premiere. Good night, Dave. Excellent. Good night, everybody. Good night.